Ms. Johnston, I believe Dr. Dark is our next speak That's speaker. Right, sir. Thank you. Dr. Dark will start by reading this summary. Thank you. We're ready. <coughs> Kia ora koutou. My name is Andrew Dark. I'm a water resource engineer employed by Aquiline Research in Christchurch. My qualifications and experience in relation to water supply and water demands for irrigation are summarised in, in my evidence in chief. So I'll take you through the key points of my evidence by reading my summary. My evidence addresses water quantity and measurement issues in Plan Change 9, relevant to viticulture in Hawke's Bay. In particular, my evidence focuses on how Plan Change 9 allocates water for irrigation, and my summary mm. focuses on the actual and re reasonable definition. My evidence focuses on the allocation of water in accordance with actual and reasonable use. Plan Change 9 proposes to allocate water for irrigation takes based on the least of either actual historical data over a 10 year period, or the Ericalc water demand model, or a suitable equivalent approved by Council that utilises crop type, soil type, and climatic conditions to determine efficient water allocations for irrigation uses. In my opinion, this overall approach to allocating water is suitable, provided that the methodology for determining actual, actual and reasonable is robust and fair. As outlined in my evidence, I have concerns about the robustness of the proposed definition of actual and reasonable, particularly around the use of averages, the least of either condition, and the likely implications for setting reasonable use volumes. I note that the definition of actual and reasonable is intended to provide users with 95% supply reliability. Supply reliability is not specifically defined within Plan Change 9, but should ideally be assessed from both a supply, water availability, and demand, or water need, perspective. In my evidence, I have assumed that 95% supply reliability refers to the 95th percentile annual demand from the Aracalc online tool meaning that sufficient water is allocated to meet crop demands in 19 out of 20 years on average. I consider this is a, a more appropriate metric to use when considering reasonable water use. And I note that this, uh, this definition that I've assumed is consistent with uh, what council officers have used in reply evidence, uh, referring specifically to Rob, Rob Walden's um, evidence, paragraph 313. Overall, I consider that using the current online Aracalc tool to calculate actual and reasonable use volumes is, a useful, is useful as a default or start point for resource consent applications and may be able to be relied on fully for a vineyard that is set up and managed in a relatively standard way, i.e. where the assumed model parameters match the actual vineyard setup. However, it is important to understand the limitations of this approach. And I, I draw, your, draw your attention to section G of my evidence in chief, where I uh, discuss the differences between the Aracalc online tool and the Aracalc model itself. As I discuss in my evidence, a number of factors, including vine variety and how the vineyard is planted and vine canopy is managed, may mean that the crop coefficients used in the model which underpins the tool do not exactly represent the water use of vines in a, a particular vineyard. In my view, further research is required to quantify the effects of these factors on the crop coefficients for grapevines and the implications for water use requirements. In addition, the accuracy of the results given by the Aracalc online tool could be improved by improving the input data sets. The climate inputs could be improved considerably by using interpolated climate data with a finer spatial resolution for example, a 500 metre grid <coughs> rather than the existing five kilometre grid spacing, and the soils data could be updated. For examples that I considered 
or my evidence, the actual use, based on water meter data, is reasonably consistent with the volumes calculated from the Aracalc online tool, but this will not always be the case. Consent holders should be able to present water use data supported by soil moisture data or other contextual information to show that the measurements represent reasonable and efficient use of water in support of an annual volume that is higher than the Aracalc volume. I do not agree with suggestions in the section 42A hearing report that Aracalc tends to over, overestimate water needs for irrigation and I'm, I'm unclear on the basis for these suggestions. While it may be the case that Aracalc produces an overestimate in some circumstances where there are fine textured soils with a high water table, I am confident that for free draining soils with a deeper water table, as typically occupied by viticulture in Hawke's Bay, the Aracalc out outputs are a robust assessment of reasonable use. The proposed least of either approach to determining actual and reasonable use in combination with the proposed reliance on average water use over the 2010 to 2020 period is likely to have a major impact on the annual volume limits that will be placed on consents when they are re reviewed or renewed. As I discussed in my evidence, an average over a 10 year period is not necessarily a valid comparison with a 95% reliability number from longer term modelling. Therefore, in my view, there is a need to continue to refine the online Aracalc tool to improve its accuracy and increase the level of confidence that growers have in its results. <coughs> As neither measured water use data or Aracalc can be relied on to accurately represent reasonable use in all circumstances, it would be appropriate for the policy framework in Plan Change 9 to recognise that while Aracalc is a useful method of undertaking reasonable use calculations, some flexibility may be needed in instances where actual and reasonable use allocation does not deliver enough water all year round for vineyard operations. The Plan Change 9 provisions should enable additional site-specific information to be considered and should not pre preclude alternatives where growers are able to show that the volumes from Aracalc are sufficient for their circumstances, for example, based on site-specific soil and rainfall data. And I'd like to, to reiterate the point that Ms Johnston made in legal submissions around how the council officers have relied on an approach that combines modelling and measurements to estimate the, the total volume of, of water taken from the Heratonga Plains aquifer and the, the comment made at paragraph 311 of uh, Rob Waldron's evidence that notes that combining modelled water use data with available metered data provides the best available estimate of water use over time. The proposed least of either approach precludes the use of water metered data to show that the Aracalc volume is sufficient for a particular vineyard. It risks equity and fairness issues. Average measured water use data over the 10 year period preceding May 2020 should not be relied on to determine actual and reasonable use, as this results in irrigation take volumes that are insufficient for water demands in dry years. I note that the addendum report to the section 42A hearing report dated 19th of May 2021 has reinstated the reference to the maximum annual take with, within the definition of actual and reasonable, and I agree with this change. Mathematically, taking an average of values over a period will always result in a lower number than the maximum over that period. Further, the analysis completed for my evidence, where I've analysed <coughs> uh, water use data from a number of vineyards, shows that the inclusion of the additional drought years uh, water monitoring through to May 2020, but with a change to the average of that amount, is not equivalent to the demand for water at 95% supply reliability. The average water use over the 10 year period up to May 2020 is 68% of the 95th percentile value. If water had been allocated on this basis, water users would have had insufficient water to meet full vineyard demand approximately four years out of 10. And Ms Taylor's evidence addresses the effects of water stress on viticulture. 
I'm aware that evidence filed on behalf of Ngāti Kahununu Iwi Incorporated suggests that actual and reasonable use should be defined by reference to the lowest annual take in the 10 years prior to uh, May 2020. In my view, the maximum approach proposed in Plan Change 9 is much more likely to be representative of the long-term actual and reasonable water use at a 95% reliability, provided that the measurements are representative of the vineyard's long-term water use. The addendum report has not addressed my concerns regarding the least of either provision in the actual and reasonable definition. While this approach safeguards against annual volume, uh, against setting an annual volume based on measured water use that reflects inefficient irrigation, there is a risk that without being able to fully account for the context of the measured water use, the data may not be representative of a vineyard's long-term water use, even when inter-annual variability due to climate is accounted for. Potential reasons for this were included in my evidence, including establishment or redevelopment of vineyards, where parts of the vineyard may be fallow or may contain young vines with different water requirements to fully established vines. Also, low, low flow restrictions that prevent water being taken, even though there is a demand for it. <clears throat> where measured water use has been reduced due to low flow restrictions, in my opinion, this is not a true ref reflection of actual and reasonable use and should not be compared with ericult numbers, which are based on water being av available whenever required. Irrigation systems that contain storage, um, and in that case the, the stored water may have been taken in a different hydrological year to when it is used on the vineyard. Also under or over irrigation, which may occur due to lack of soil moisture monitoring. However, as you've already heard uh, <coughs> this morning, soil moisture monitoring is common and considered good practice in viticulture and over irrigation is typically avoided as it can have a, a detrimental effect on um, crop quality. And finally, the, the actual and reasonable definition refers to insufficient or no accurate data. The terms insufficient and accurate are not defined, but are likely to refer to the water use records being gap free and the flow meter being installed and maintained in compliance with HBRC's technical specifications and installation requirements for flow meters document. Without further context about how the water is being used, however, I do not consider this to address whether the data actually reflects reasonable use. Thank you, Dr. Dyke. We'll take questions. Can I take you to your figures and your evidence in chief, please? Because yes. I'm struggling to understand them. So you're referring to figure one? Yep. So my first question, when you're talking about annual water use in figure one, mm -hmm. is that over a calendar year or is that over a water year? That's over an irrigation season. Sorry? That's over an irrigation season, so it's within a water year. So if we take a water year as starting 1 July going through to 30th of June, the irrigation season within that water year would typically be from say October to March or April. So would your suggestion to us when we f refer to a year is we should refer to a water year? I think that would be consistent with, um, with what's actually happening on irrigated properties. So figures one and two show the same information or the same um, two vineyards if you like. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference? One talks about annual water use, and the next one talks about normalised water, annual water use. What is the difference, please? The, the reason for normalising by the mean was to <coughs> highlight the fact that although, although in, in any, um, any given year there may be differences between particular vineyards or differences between uh, a model result and a, a vineyard's actual water use. We, when you normalise by a by a mean value, you can see how the the actual water use and the modelled water use respond to climate. 
so you can see more clearly the effects of, of wetter and drier years in, in figure two versus figure one. Okay, thank you. Then when we come to figure three, we're again talking about annual water use, and I just want to go through the vineyards that you've actually plotted there. So this is on paragraph 71 of your evidence yes. in chief. So example C is water storage filled from the Nauroro River. Yes. So what that is saying is that annual water use and the Ericult volume is much higher than um, the actual uses in any case, um, or almost higher. Um, what that is saying is that in the drought year, in the drought season 2019, I assume that's 2019-2020 irrigation year? That's correct. So in that the water use was quite high, am I assuming that that is being fully supplied, that's the actual water use, so that's being replenished by the irrigation storage? <coughs> The, the data that I've analysed doesn't distinguish between what is taken to refill storage and what's, what's then used from storage or other sources to irrigate on farm. And that, that's actually quite an important issue because a, a water meter record will not necessarily tell you whether that, that water has been, sure. has been used for irrigation or it's been used for, for replenishing storage. But it's a not unreasonable assumption. It, it depends. It depends on a range of things like the the volume of storage and um, the the storage <coughs> that the the state of the storage at the um, end of the previous irrigation season. Whether the property owner has has decided to keep the storage empty over winter or refill it with higher flows in winter. So, the examples E and F, when you say groundwater subject to low flow restrictions, um, for, for instance, for example, E, is that a groundwater take in Zone 1 along the Nauroro? I, I don't recall the exact um, location of, of these examples with respect to the different zones, but uh, where I've referred to groundwater takes being subject to low flow restrictions, they're hydraulically connected takes that are subject to river low flows. And that's the only area that would be potentially affected. So is that looking, is your example E there saying annual, annual water use, if it was subject to those low flow restrictions in the narrow Aurora, would be this in 2019-2020, or is that their actual water use? The uh, the data that I've plotted in Figure Three is the the actual water use of that vineyard. So they're not subject to low flow restrictions at the moment. So that, so that they're not so as I would understand it, they're not subject to those. Um, restrictions on takes from the Nauroro when it's in low flow and surface water takes that are prohibited or um, have been have been ceased more accurately. Ms Taylor might be able to assist if that's all right, Commissioner. Sorry? Ms Taylor might be able to assist with that question if that's all right. Thank you. Yeah, so we do have a number of vineyards in Hawke's Bay that are already groundwater takes in Zone 1 that are, do have a cut off when the surface water reaches the minimum level. Yep, so we do have uh, quite a number of vineyards that are in that already and we need to supply you the numbers of those. We do also have some vineyards that will be newly classified as Zone 1 um, under this plan change as well. So, but. Uh, for Mr. Dark's evidence, it will be the ones that are existing. Okay. Yeah. So this is a zone one cut off now mm -hmm. that's represented by <coughs> that purple line. Yeah. Thank you.
So what does, if that's example E, what is, it says example F, did it have water storage at the time this was being, this was, sorry, um, does this graph assume or does this graph reflect um, some water storage on that property? Yes, it, it does for, from the information that I've been provided. Although, it, as I noted before, it, I don't, I don't know the um, sure. the relativity of, of when water was being taken from storage versus when uh, when it was taken from the source directly. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Just go to your summary evidence, um, the last paragraph, 11E, when you're talking about actual and reasonable, reasonable definitions, and you comment on the fact that um, inefficient, insufficient or no accurate data are terms that aren't defined in, in, the, in Plan Change 9, um, and, but you've referred to a document there, um, Regional Council document about flow metering, technical specifications, and installation requirements for flow meter document. Flow meters document. Are you recommending that um, the definition of actual and reasonable include reference to that particular document? I was, I was hurriedly looking through Mr. St. Clair's evidence to see whether he incorporated anything like that into proposed amendment to that definition but the question is uh, are you, well two parts are you suggesting that there is some definition about what constitutes insufficient or uh, no accurate data and if so what are you suggesting? My, my key point there is to, to clarify what's meant by insufficient or no accurate data. Um, for example if, if you have two years of, of water use data, is, is that sufficient? If you have um, several years of, of data but there are gaps mm. in the data set, is that sufficient? Yep. That, that doesn't, appear, it doesn't appear to be defined at present. No, and it's a good point because I can see that can be a, a bone of contention or argument about what's, what's sufficient and what's not. And so, I, But I was looking to some guidance as to some suggested um, amendment to, to address that particular issue, whether you had anything in particular? The, um, the, the HBRC technical specifications will relate more to, uh, to how metres are installed and the standards for the, uh, for the data coming out of those. I'm, I'm not sure whether that document goes so far as to talk about uh, gaps and records and that kind of thing. So is there anything, to your knowledge, in the plan, in the draft plan, which um, provides a mechanism for determining, by any party, including the council, whether a data set is you know, fit for purpose with respect to actual and reasonable, and, and clause B in particular? I, I'm not aware of anything that addresses that uh, fitness for purpose issue. Um, Mr. Sinclair may be able to point to something. Do you want to hear from me now? Um, well, we, we can wait till you. Okay. Till it's your turn, but I'm happy for you yeah. if you've got a comment now. So, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that defines that it would, um, in terms of uh, whether the, or whether the council maybe has a. Um, already established practice that it uses in assessing that, but I'm not aware of anything in the plan that specifies how that, how sufficient data would be determined. Right, thank you for that. It, it might be for question for council staff down the track. Thank you. If, I'm, if I may, Commissioner, it is one of the reasons why that flexibility in terms of um, use of measured or modelled becomes quite uh, highlighted with that example, 
in the sense that if there are limitations in data or uh, an approach isn't working either by a measured or a modelled way, the ability to combine or have some flexibility in how that actual and reasonable use is determined becomes even more important. And that, that's one of the examples of how it's not quite working uh, from the perspective of the wine growers. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just one more question for Dr. Dark. The 42A addendum had a um, statement of reply from Dr. Rajan Yaka yes, from Niwa, and um, he's commented on some of your evidence about, I think in particular about crop coefficients mm -hmm. being fit for purpose. Um, wondering whether you've got any comments in reply to those comments. Yes. So uh, Dr. Rajanayaka has, has agreed that uh, crop coefficients may, may vary between farms and that further research may lead to uh, development of better crop coefficients. He has he's referred to some work that he was involved in regarding optimising of system capacities for irrigation systems. Um, my opinion is that that work is not highly relevant to, uh, to viticulture. It was uh, work that was done in relation to irrigation of pasture. And given that irrigation already has <coughs> a, a lower system capacity than pastoral systems, I think there's le less room to move in terms of optimising system capacities. That, uh, th that work that he refers to also make some assumptions about uh, permissible amounts of, of water stress and I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to, to apply those results in a viticulture context given what we've already heard from Ms <coughs> Taylor about the effects of water stress on, on vines. Okay. So you're not swayed by his reply? <laughs> I think in, in, in some ways the, the comments that Dr. Rajanayaka has made support the position of being able to combine um, measurements and models to get the best outcome. He, he refers to uh, a, a couple of, I guess you'd call them cliches about modelling um, in terms of all models are wrong, but some are useful, and also you can't can't manage what you don't measure. And taking those two statements together, to me, Im implies that to get the best outcome, we need to look at both measurements and modelling. And that's that's something that's not permitted by the least of either approach. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. You work for Aqualink, and Aqualink runs the IRACULP model, is that correct? That's correct. So you say in your evidence and, um, that IRACULP doesn't overestimate water use. Um, and I know that these models are a highly iterative process and keep improving. The staff are of the view that it does overestimate water use, and I suppose I've heard from um, including Dr. Davron yesterday, who I asked a question directly of, um, that Eric Help consistently overestimates water use on a variety of soil types and in a variety of situations. It's important because the, if you go away from the least of test, um, then Eric Help, the accuracy of Eric Help becomes quite important. Are there any independent peer reviews that would substantiate your statement that you disagree that um, Eric Helk overestimates water use? And if so, can they be provided to us, please? Because that's not my current impression, and that's based on hearing about it for a long time. I, 
I would have to come back to you with details of any specific peer reviews. Um, If, if, some, if some independent verification of that could be provided, that would be really helpful. Um, because at, at the moment, my impression is to agree with the staff that it does overestimate. But I know these things improve all the time. And you've spoken in your own evidence about a greater level of resolution in the model and going down to smaller grid sizes and so forth. And I know these things are an evolving process. So. If there's any independent evidence to substantiate that, peer reviews, anything like that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. I'll, I'll note that. That's my only other question. Okay. Um, I had a question. It's in, a, it's in the same area. It's just at um, paragraph 53, where you say the accuracy of the results given by your Calc online tool could be improved by. And I just want to make sure that I've got those things that you think it could be improved with, and that's the climate data climate change effects, uh, soil data, uh, and was there any, anything else? Can you point me to the paragraph number there? Oh, sorry, uh, the paragraph 53. 53. Sorry. <coughs> I've got it right here in front of me. So it just starts with the sentence, the accuracy of the results given by the Eric Hulk online tool could be improved by. And I yes. just want to make sure I've got the list of those things so that you've identified. That, that paragraph refers to the model inputs. Uh, so yes, I've, yes. I've noted there the, um, the climate inputs and the soil data that the model relies on. Yes. The, the other aspect that I've discussed elsewhere in my events is the, uh, the crop factors and mm -hmm. that, yep. how, how they uh, reflect the, um, the great variety in the vineyard management. Mm -hmm. And, and just just as a, just a clarification, what would we be involved in undertaking or have, getting those improvements? The uh, improvement of climate inputs that that's a relatively straightforward analysis task. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the underlying data required to do that already exists. The, uh, the soils data, there is, um, there is more recent data through uh, SMAP, which is Manaki Whenua Landcare Research's soils database, yes. and that's being improved on an ongoing basis. However, it's, it's important to note that the, the data sets in the Aracalc online tool were developed some years ago, mm -hmm. and that there's, there's no no mechanism at present for, for continuous updating of that tool. That was going to be my next question, which you've answered. Thank you. <coughs> we'll see if we've got any other questions. Yeah. I'll just um, check. Thank you. Who have we got next? Uh, Dr. Messi, thank you. Chair. Kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Edwin Massey, Tokuunga. Uh, I'm the General Manager of Sustainability at New Zealand Wine Growers. Um, I've been in that position for, for two years and have worked for um, the organisation for, for five years. Um, you have seen my evidence. Um, I just really want to highlight the, the key points um, in my executive summary uh, as follows. Yeah, sustainability really is um, a crucial component. Well, just hold on, talk. That, that's the summary that's in the evidence. Yes, yes, yes. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Sustainability is a, is a crucial component of the New Zealand wine industry, yeah, and, and more than that, it, it really is you know, a unique selling point um, for, for our wine. Um, and, in, in market, you know, we don't have the, the 2,000 years of history um, as some in Europe may have, but we do have, you know, um, you know the reputation for sustainable production that, that really uh, sits our 
our wine at, at, at the highest level uh, worldwide. Now, water is a really key focus area um, of our overall approach to sustainability and our goal is to be a world leader in efficient water use and the protection of water quality. Yeah. Well, I think um, that the goal of the wine industry and, um, with regards to water is very similar um, and aligns well with the, goal, uh, the goals of the um, regional council and, and um, that the, the tank plan change is trying to achieve. And I think that degree of alignment means that um, when, with regard to swins, there is a um, you know, really good potential um, for uh, Sustainable Wine Growing New Zealand as an industry program to, to collect, collate and analyse information um, and present that um, to council to highlight um, you know, the efforts of our members um, to ensure you know, the sustainable use of water um, in, in viticultural and winemaking production. Swins um, has been around for 25 years and, and you know, is a, um, regarded worldwide as a, as a flagship sustainability program um, in, in the wine industry. But 25 years of history um, does not mean much if you can't meet the needs um, of, of, of your members in the present and the future or you know, meet the needs of um, the social licence to operate. And, and SWINS, um, you know, as a program, over the last two years, we've really focused on a review um, and to adapt you know, to, to the changing needs of our members and society. And, and you know, we're, we're willing um, you know, to, to engage with council to ensure um, the needs of, you know, of the um, Hawke's Bay community are met um, and that SWINS can provide the means to achieve you know, the, the farm planning requirements um, for our members. Yeah, it's been really great to see um, the, the changes that um, have come to, to Schedule 30 since the um, evidence has been uh, submitted. Um, and you know, in good faith, I you know, certainly will look to engage speedily um, with, with uh, Hawke's, Hawke's Bay Regional Council staff um, to, to further those conversations. Um, but in summary, we think you know, that the it's my opinion that, that SWINS really does have the potential to deliver some of the outcomes um, that, that you seek uh, through the plan change and um, there, we have a, a great willingness to work together um, and, and you know, to engage in dialogue to ensure that that can occur. See if we've got any questions. Can I just take you to your paragraph? Um, it must be 39E on page 12 of your evidence. And you talk about in the second half of that paragraph that SWINS cannot meet the auditing requirements due to the costs of annual audits. Um, and you say that to be subject to annual audits is a particularly onerous regulatory burden and that it should be scaled consistently with the level of risk. Are these programs accepted to your knowledge by other regional councils in a similar context, and is a three-year period acceptable to them? So, two parts. Um, firstly, this Hawke's Bay is at the vanguard you know, of, of the, the um, planning and, and changes in, in terms of water management, so we have, haven't had to engage you know, with regional councils regarding the use of SWINS as an industry um, programme in other regions to date. You know, those conversations are starting in other areas, such as Marlborough. Um, so the answer is no. But um, I do note in the, um, the, um, or the, the, the changes to the, or the recommended changes um, based on evidence that have been submitted, um, there was um, some recommendations made 
regarding the auditing requirements um, and that um, you know, the potential for annual audits was not um, fixed and that there, could, um, you know, there was acceptance that, that um, the, <coughs> an annual auditing requirement may not be necessary. You know, I'm really positive um, about you know, and, and grateful for, for that recommendation being made and you know, certainly um, would seek to engage further with, with council officials to, um, you know, to, to sort out you know, exactly what, what is required. It would be good if you could engage with the council officials and let us know what the answer is, please. Sure. <laughs> um, my second question is, what, are the, what is the extent of the difference between this programme and NZ GAP, the Hort NZ programme, in terms of um, the outputs that come out of it, please? Are they broadly comparable? in terms of what's required and what the reporting requirements are? Broadly comparable, um, yes. Um, often in NZGAP, the, the reporting requirements and, and standards are set by you know, regional regulations or, or, yes. or national, you know, national rules. Yes. Um, for um, SWINs, we've essentially set um, standards often ab above those, um, and, and they're not or have not been to date anchored to um, regulatory requirements in specific regions. Um, they've been more set um, at a level based on um, you know, potential interest in the market and, and from, from overseas, but also um, you know, um, around the, the basis to ensure social licence to operate and guided by um, you know, decisions made at board level. But both are very similar to the extent that what they're trying to achieve is saying that this product meets high standards, or these products meet high standards, and so are totally suitable for export. Is that a fair...? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fair summary. I mean, it's trying to establish um, best... Both programmes try to establish best agricultural practice um, in their respective, um, you know, industries. OK, thank you. I just had a, a few questions. The SWINS program is something new to me, and I just wondered whether it responds in a, in a, in a national way to... You said that it's not intended necessarily to be a regulatory tool, but, but I'm wondering whether it responds in any way to... in a social licence way to special relationships of Māori with ancestral lands and waters, to Mano to Y and those types of things? Yeah, so as, as outlined previously, SWINS, you know, to date, you know, has, has not, um, you know, specifically responded to those matters. However, you know, as, you know, since um, 2019 in, the, in the, the review of SWINS, you know, what social licence to operate is in New Zealand, an, an interpretation of that is rapidly changing. You know, and it's really important um, that the program changes to meet those um, requirements of, of, of society. And so, um, you know, while it hasn't as yet, you know, by being involved in processes such as this um, and, and, and seeking uh, to uh, you know, things such as equivalence, um, you know, we are um, rapidly adapting the program to meet new sets of needs. You've suggested that the, the SWINS program could be, um, my words, retrofitted, but it could align quite well with with um, freshwater plans in, in the future. How, how far away do you think that is Look, uh, from, from your perspective? I think um, for our program to remain relevant with our members, we must move quickly um, to, to ensure um, we can meet those requirements. It will require investment. Um, investment is, is you know, based on levy, um, and you know, that, that, that happens on an annual cycle. Um, so you know, as quickly as possible um, would, would be the answer. Um, at uh, paragraph 20, um, and there's been questions about 
annual auditing and the like. And, and just in that last uh, sentence, so if, particularly in regards to uh, the SWINs requirements, and I'm not sure exactly what, what they might be, but if these corrective actions are not met, ultimately lead to deregistration. And I was wondering if anyone's been deregistered. Uh, yes, they have. Um, then they have been um, you know, re-registered. You know, it's, a, it's a continuous improvement type model. Um, and you know, we are working on uh, terms and conditions uh, which uh, specifically um, go into more details around breaches. Um, those are yet to be signed off. I, I should have asked, it was probably more appropriate for me to ask questions relevant to the plan change that we're considering, were there any matters, has any been deregistered in regards to water use or? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Turn to paragraph 23, terms of those benefits. Uh, I, I, my summary of those things is it's, there's information collection, so that's, there's a voluntary program of providing answers to the, to the questionnaire. Um, so it's, there's some verification of that information, is that correct? So, yes, the audits happen every three years. Every three so, years, yes, so that's the audit. Yeah, they, they submit um, their questionnaire across the, the six focus areas of the program, um, and then that, that, that information is verified by, by an audit every three years. And, and the benchmarking on water use, what does that look like? So essentially it provides them with um, information relative to other users in the region, so right. where, where their water use is um, relative to the, the Hawke's Bay average, say, or um, Marlborough average. Um, you know, and with the shift to um, you know, mandatory uh, collection of information on totals, you know, that, that benchmarking um, will become much more um, accurate. Thank you. Um, just, just going to paragraph 30, um, this might be just for my benefit rather than the other panel members. Can you just explain to me um, table one? I, I'm assuming I'm reading it from left to right. Yes. And um, if you could just go through those just those numbers and, and what they mean. Sure. Be so this, this data is drawn from the 2019-20 growing season. It's yes. really um, important to note that for that year, um, information on total water use was um, and, irriga and irrigation optimisation techniques were not compulsory. Yep. So this is not a, a comprehensive data set. Okay. Um, so based on the, the, the results that we've got there, um, highlights that we've got 3,000 577 uh, hectares of irrigated vineyard, yep. um, and of that, the, um, the irrigated area with recorded water use is, is 2,263 hectares. So, that, and then the, the rest highlight, um, as per the scorecard, or as it was then, mm -hmm. um, that is the, the totals, um, the, the data that we have collected, um, and it highlights the you know, total um, recorded use uh, water use in millimetres, uh, water use litres per vine, um, the, the planting density of, of that area, and then the total rainfall. Based on that irrigated area of 67%? Yes. Yep, okay, thank you. That's great. That was all our questions, thank you. Thank you, Chair. That leaves Mr. St. Clair, who will commence with readiness summary. Um, good afternoon, you don't Mr. St. Clair. You're, you're known to all the panel members. <laughs> I <laughs> it. <laughs> um, if I could start, please, by just making a couple of corrections to my um, evidence in chief, please. Um, if I could take you to page 9, paragraph 38. Is that paragraph 78? Uh, page 30, 38, 38 on page 9. Oh. And just in the first line there, in my view, the office have set out fulsome, there should be a fulsome assessment. And then below that, to hopefully be more helpful, in the footnote 18, part 9A of the Resource Management Act, 
Um, I'm, rather than make an assumption that everybody knows, that's actually the freshwater farm plans and that's section 217A, capital A, to 217, capital M. Uh, 217 capital A to section 217 capital M. Um, and then the next, um, I then want to go to um, paragraph 59 um, where I've set out where the term versatile land ap appears, but this is on pages 14 through 16. Um, on 16, at the end of it, it says um, emphasis added, which was to make it easier to um, find the term versatile land. However, the, um, the emphasis seems to have been dropped off. So um, if I could take you to page 15, towards the top of the page, C, at the end of the first line, is the reference to versatile land. Then in the struck out D, the fourth line, towards the end of that, is versatile land there. And then over the page on um, policy tank 56C, at the very end of that is the term versatile land. That's helpful. You may not know, but we've, we've got a black and white version printed. Oh. So I just thought it lost it in the colours. Yeah. <laughs> so that's helpful. Thank you. Um, could I just clarify first? So do you want me to read my s summary? I'm happy to do so. Um, we're happy to just perhaps you um, point out the important points you want to make. We've, we've had a chance to have a, a skim okay. read of it last night. Um, certainly I have this morning, um, and then we'll, we can ask some questions. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, just in relation to the, um, the relevant planning instruments, and I think they've been identified as the NPSFM 2020 um, and the regional policy statement, which is the, the parts that um, need to be given effect to in terms of the plan change needs to, to do that. And then in three, I've set out um, the objectives and policies in relation to the RPS in particular that um, are, are applicable to the wine growing industry. And then I've also set out that you need, uh, Section 32 analysis needs to be, uh, evaluation needs to be undertaken even when you're giving effect to those higher order documents. The uh, policy 11 of the MPSFM, um, in my view, doesn't necessitate a uniform cap on water allocation across um, all users at the status quo, um, it requires it to be phased out and no additional, um, uh, what is it, over allocation, continued um, allocation to be um, undertaken. In terms of four, just relating to the, um, six, again, section 32, that's about the appropriateness um, of the objectives and provisions, and just from a planning perspective, there's, those, um, there's a different test for objectives than there is the prov provisions, provisions being um, the policies, uh, methods and rules. The turning to the water allocation um, framework and uh, my assess, um, assessment and my evidence included a critique of the Officer's Section 32 report regarding the um, changes to the definition of actual and reasonable 
in relation to maximum and average and um, the least of approach. Um, and in, in my view, that assessment was too broad with um, insufficient regard to the benefits and costs to, um, to viticulture. Um, I note that in the addendum report, um, the maximum in terms of the annual take for actionable reasonable has been reinstated, and in my view that's um, appropriate for the reasons set out in my evidence. Um, at seven, I also um, support the change in relation to um, the 10 years proceeding um, up to the 2nd of May 2020. Um, the addendum report, um, as far as I go, didn't identify or address the issues I um, raised in relation to the least of either structure and in terms of the, the definition of actual and reasonable. Um, my evidence recommended changes to this approach, um, uh, relying on the evidence of Dr. Dark and Ms. Taylor that um, would result in reduced volumes of water available to the volume needed by vineyards <coughs> and the tank catchments, and that least of structure would result in viticulture's existing and future operations being constrained uh, with environmental, economic and social impacts. Um, in terms of other matters, um, I have agreed with the officer's proposed changes to uh, Schedule 28, um, which has uh, made it clear the production of land in the source protection zones requires uh, farm plans as a high priority and to be prepared within three years. Uh, I, at 10, I generally support the um, proposed changes to Schedule 30. Uh, and um, um, I think that section 30 now um, better reflecting what, what is required of these regulatory tools within the, the region. Um, and I've, um, that, that greater detail, and I think you've, um, in terms of how the national program might fit within Hawke's Bay, and I think you've traversed most of that with Dr Massey. Now, um, at 11, um, re in reference to Schedule 29, which now includes grapes at the same level as other horticultural crops, um, so that's in terms of land use to control um, such uh, nitrogen and phosphorus discharges. Um, as has been pointed out earlier, even with that, the biggest ch um, factor limiting viticulture then would be access to water even with that that change to Schedule 29. Um, at 12, um, I've set out A to E to F there, the um, uh, changes uh, addressed in my evidence, particularly to um, uh, tank uh, to Objective Tank 9, um, changing as an outcome statement, which the officers agreed with. Um, in B, the, um, this was in relation to Objective 16, um, in relation to the terms versatile soils and versatile land. Um, the, I'd put forward a s solution to that, however, um, now that I've seen the um, response, I think the officers' um, framing of uh, the wording, and that's much more elegant solution than what I'm, the one I put forward. Um, the outstanding matters are, are really in, in D, which is around the actual and reasonable use definition. Um, at, at E, uh, this is in relation to paragraph 108 of my evidence. And if I could just take you to that, because um, it's a difference in the, 
wording. Um, so in paragraph 108 of my evidence in chief on page 29, at the end, um, at the end of it, it's, it's set, it says, if water harvesting and storage, I've suggested putting in water harvesting, storage and the controlled release, is, um, the officers thought that um, it was implicit within the objective that the release was included. Um, however, I've sort of reflected on that a bit further and I, I think that it still needs to be there because you can't rely on something that's implicit. And I know that in terms of some regional councils require um, discharge permits in relation to dam takes, diversions, that sort of thing. So that's separation between 14 and 15. So I um, think that that should be um, included. So just to be very clear, that's in 18F, 18F water harvesting, yes. storage and controlled release. You yes. think those words should be? I, in my view, they should be included. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there was also one, one part in my um, evidence which is um, because I'm a planner and I go on about section 32 quite a bit. Um, par probably paragraph 101 summarizes um, what I what I think sh should have occurred, and this is because viticulture is at um, being very efficient and it being locked in at that point that the an analysis that's included in the section 32 didn't assess the differences between water users in, in relation to efficiency what it did was that it assessed the um, it assessed actual three three options um, rather than, it seemed to me that you would need to um, look at it between different water users in order to be un, uh, able to understand what the impacts on those um, different sectors might be. to the matters that Commissioner Cowie asked me about very shortly. Um, one thing with all of these that I, I could take you to um, Tank Rule 9. This is on page 46 of the, uh, the addendum. Tank Rule 9 in terms of the activity refers to replacement of the existing resource consent to take. Um, I think that should be take and use as it is in 10 and 11. That might have been drawn to your attention already but it's just something I, I noticed. Um, then Commissioner Cowie asked me about earlier were there any submissions on behalf of wine growers as the um, in relation to um, Rule 11 and Schedule 31. Um, in if I could take you to in the submissions of Perno Rickard. So give us, you'll have to give us um, just a little time yep. to find them, uh, Mr. Sinclair.
Do you, do you have their submission number there? Yeah, uh, 194. That's helpful. Thank you. And um, if you went to page 54. Sorry, let me go to the, I need to, we need to find it first, or I need to find it first. Yep, and what page number, please? Okay. If you start at page 54. Of that submission. Of that submission. Um, and submission reference number 93. Yep. So those um, 93, 94 and 95 are all in relation to Schedule 31. And then 95 is in relation to Schedule 31 and Tank Rule 11. You can see on the right-hand side what that it also relates to. Um, those are, depending on the nature of your questions, it might be that one of those submission points um, provides the scope. It's probably a bit of a long bow from the submission, but let me ask you the question anyway. Um, at the moment, as I read the Rule 11, mm -hmm. so this is for potential new takes, and it refers to its discretionary yes. and condition two, um, B2, refers to the total amount taken either by itself or in combination with others. Mm -hmm. uh, relevant quantity matter referred, specified in Schedule 1. And so if it doesn't meet this rule, it then defaults to prohibited. Yep. If we go to Schedule 31, mm -hmm. which I need to find, Um, I'm on Appendix 2B of the Recommended Changes, page 58, for Schedule 31. I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so that rule refers to Schedule 31. So if we take an example and we look at, say, um, Nauraura groundwater, Yes. Or we look at um, Hiratonga Plains groundwater. Those refer to existing uses only. So my understanding of that rule is that under, sorry, my understanding of the interrelationship between the schedule and the rule mm. is that if you apply for or sorry, you can't apply to take any additional water from Nauraura groundwater because it refers to existing use only. The same with Hiratonga Plains groundwater. Is that your reading of how that rule, how the schedule would apply to that rule? Um, just looking at the um, note that mm. relates to that. So, so the rule refers to the schedule. Sure. Yep. The schedule says, and it's for potential new takes. Rule 11. In, in B, in tank rule 11, 
11. 11. I, th I think it's 11 B2. B, yeah, 2. But it's, it's either Roman numeral 1 or, or 2. So either in terms of Roman numeral 1 is either for the continuation of a water take as previously permitted or individually, then I wouldn't one apply without reference to two? two. Yeah. And yes, in A, you don't have, um, it tells you that you're not seven, eight, nine, or 10, and then you're either B, um, Roman one in brackets, or two. So in Roman numeral one, it doesn't appear there's a reference to the schedule. And that's one's for an application is either for the continued continuation of a take previously authorised, so if you've already got a consent, then one would apply and not necessarily with reference to Schedule 30, one, because that only applies to Roman numeral two. So you read I'd that. So you read the, that the same way as I do. That if it refers to a relevant quantity area as specified in Schedule Thirty One to be exceeded, and that then talks about existing use only. That rule so does not allow for new takes from. Yep. And I those areas? Yeah, because the new takes, and I think that would that would follow <coughs> on from the policy, which I'm thinking around 37, somewhere around there, I'd have to go and look. That yeah. that would probably be consistent with that in terms of new takes. So the default rule there is prohibited. Mm -hmm. Should that be a should that be a prohibited activity in all circumstances for new activities? depend on how much weight you would place in terms of having to give effect to the NPS 21, 2020 to avoid over allocation. Okay. Mm, thank you. Yep, um, what is it? I think Turner Ricard's submission uh, suggested that that might be non-complying activity rather than yes, yes, than prohibited. So what we need to think about, if it were a non-complying activity, how would the, um, the how would that fit with existing objectives and policies? Yes, yep. because it's unlikely to get through on the basis of effects no more than minor. Oh, no. And the other. yeah. And policies are quite directive. Yes. Yeah. yes. So the second issue I raised with you was the one um, we have, there are existing rules relating to section 14 3B takes, yes. which provide essential water for stock drinking. Mm. Um, and that's been a long established um, procedure during the Act, and we've heard submissions that the 20 cubic metres a day may not be sufficient on some properties, and that's another matter. We've also heard evidence, um, such as from Ms Taylor and from apple growers, that if crops don't receive water, they die. Yep. Um, and one of the thoughts that enters my head is that 
given irrigation restrictions are quite common in Hawke's Bay, uh, could there be some equivalent provision that said you can take enough water, just enough water, to keep your crops alive regardless of? Now, I'm not asking for an answer to that question now, um, but it was raised by one of the apple growers yesterday as um, the RMA doesn't give us any flexibility about these things, mm -hmm. um, and that was his point. If you could have a think about that and see whether there are any provisions in other plans or any possible wording we could look at around that sort of thing, that would be helpful. Yep. Um, it's my idea rather than the idea of others here, right. so um, it's just a bright spark in my head at the moment. Um, but there does seem to be a level of iniquity, at least to me, that um, stock get enough water to survive, um, and that's provided for. But crops at the moment can be subject to total bans. Um, I, I did have a quick opportunity to have a look during the um, break, and um, if I could take you to it, um, the submission of Pernod Ricard, which is number 194. Yep, I'll go back to that. Sorry, wrong one. And I'm referring to the paragraphs on the bottom of pay, um, on the bottom of the submission. It's page number three, and it's um, 9, 9E, Roman numeral two, which is, um, Tony Rickard seeks consideration of an allowance for limited takes for the purpose of rootstock protection. And in that submission, it's referring to policy capital TT 9 1F that's in the Tuki Tuk catchment, or policy 510 751 in relation to water storage directions. And then further on in the Submission um, on page 39, submission point 70, 194.70 refers to that. And then just trying to find the other page markings, sir. Um, page 20. Submission reference, reference number 37. So there's at least a couple of references in relation to that that might be of assistance. So those provisions already exist in the Toki Toki catchment, do they? Yes, I understand they came in through the Toki Toki plan change process. Thank you very much, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one, one other um, point, just in relation to, um, this is policy tank 47, which is in relation to the um, consideration of um, resource consent applications. Uh, I just noted in there, and um, there's no direct, it doesn't relate to or has no direct linkage to the definition of actual and reasonable use. So um, this 105 is um, a suggested amendment of mine that's hidden within the text rather than of my evidence, rather than set out with specific wording as I might do in blue. So um, in order to address that issue as raised by Ms. Taylor, um, an amendment to the term actual and reasonable use that included similar wording to the recommended poll tank 47B. Mm. That wording, if it included references such as suitable, equivalent, approved by council, and uh, that utilises crop type, soil type, climatic conditions. It's just 
making sure there's consistency and allowing that um, something other than the ERACALC model to be potentially used. And whether for consistency purposes, that if you're doing it in 47, because that's about surface water takes, you might want to do it in policy 37 yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 And 47A as well. Just consistency between the three things in terms of how that um, use of that additional external, a different model to Uricalc may be, may be used. See if we've got any additional uh, questions, Dr. Wright. <clears throat> On the issue of versatile land and versatile soils, yes. which you discuss yep. quite a bit, just wanted to make sure I understand correctly the situation and that is that versatile land is defined in the RRMP, in the glossary of it. Commissioner, could I ask you, um, <coughs> where are my evidence are you referring to, just so that I'm Sorry. on the same page? Uh, if you can turn to your evidence in Chief, page yep. 12. Yes. And section J. Yes, We Thank discussed you. the wording of uh, yes. versatile soils in the proposed plan change yep. 9, and you point out that um, that's not defined in the plan change, and nor is it, <clears throat> this is where I want you to advise me, nor is it defined specifically in the uh, R RMP, which does, however, define versatile land, yep. which includes reference to soils. So, yep. um, as what you're saying is that versatile soils, as as a, as a definition falls within the definition of versatile land under um, the RRMP? If effectively, um, there's a, when you look at versatile land in the um, RRMP, I think there's a footnote that, um, sorry, I'll just, I would have, just have to look that up. Um, there's a footnote that refers to um, versatile land and what that means, that it includes the soils related specifically related to viticulture. And is that the footnote 4A? Um, yep, I'm just trying to find it, sir, in terms of the plan. Four A, yes, sir. So that but it doesn't. What, does it specifically mention viticulture soils or not? I, I can't see that. Um, in terms of the definition of versatile land, up in twenty nine point two five four A, versatile land uh, B. Yes, yep. That refers to the viticultural okay. land. All right. 
And, and, and the amendment you've suggested in your revenueless uh, is to object to tanks. Mark, yes. However, I put that in, an ev in evidence, then I saw the change, sir, that the officers had made, which was to make it um, to change soils back in that objective to um, that policy to land. And then I thought that was a more elegant way of okay. addressing the matter rather than one that I'd put forward in evidence. So you're happy with that, officers? Yeah, I, the, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question. It's not perhaps um, directly to Mr. St. Clair, but to, to the panel, your panel, that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just as some regards to the involvement in the collaborative process and, and specifically related to the uniform reductions across all users proposed by proposed plan change nine and, and what was your stakeholders understanding of that issue where it had got to? Uh, I'd like to defer to Ms Taylor on that point. Mm. Yeah, so I sat on tank from for the last two years of the process. I wasn't uh, involved in it in the first three years, but our representative left the industry, and so I took over at that point. Okay. Um, at that point, that was when the science became available. So it was actually a very um, positive experience in the sense of understanding how the um, groundwater system worked. So yeah, so your question is, um, through that process, we were talking about. Um, the reduced allocation to all across all users, and throughout the tank process, the wine industry did reiterate that that actually was unfair to the wine industry, and um, was locking us in as the lowest users to the low of the low, as we've talked about. Um, throughout the tank process, there was a lots of discussion around augmentation and the ability to purchase into augmentation schemes, um, which were yeah. And I'm not sure that we've come to an appropriate conclusion uh, throughout the plan change as to how that would work and what that would look like. OK, yeah. thank you. We don't have any further questions. I, that's the end of your presentations. May I, um, and I was going to invite you if you wanted to make any concluding <laughs> remarks. Just one point I just wanted to expand on, and I think it's quite important because mm. uh, Mr Sinclair just noted that there was an aspect of his evidence that wasn't carried over into uh, the amendments shown within the plan change text, and he referred to as 105. Yes. And I know he touched on it, but I just want to make sure that, given that it wasn't in his marked up changes, we are clear about what we're asking for there. Uh, it goes to the efficiency use point that I've also raised in legal submissions, but in addition to referencing, um, if we go to policy tank, or poll tank 47, He's recommended that the wording of A and B. Can you just point us to? Uh, so I'm looking, it's probably easiest to maybe work from the page. I'm at page 29 of the addendum report dated 19 May 2021. It's the um, track change provisions, recommended changes to. Proposed plan change nine. Page 29, was it? Yes. Okay. And when it's page 29, it's page 29 oh. of um, <coughs> Appendix 2, which is the further recommended changes. Mm -hmm. So Mr. St. Clair has noted in his evidence of 105 that the wording uh, could be added into um, reference to Ericalc and the actual and reasonable use definition references to a model that utilises crop type, soil type and climatic conditions. He's also uh, just um, noted further the wording in A, which I would note is specific, that policy is specific to surface water low flow management and that wording um, 
is included to ensure that council will ensure water is allocated and used efficiently. And it gives reference there to a number of things that they will take into account in ensuring that the use of water is efficient. And that includes allocation for irrigation and use based on soil, climate and plant needs, uh, good practice, uh, the amount of water loss in soil profiles. So some very helpful uh, indicators there of efficiency. That wording is not replicated in the suite of policies that apply to allocation limits. Uh, so if you now move to page 24 in policy tank 36, and I would point you to 37. As I understand Mr Sinclair's evidence just now before you, he's invited you to consider including the wording from poll tank 47 A and B into policy tank 37 so that those efficiency factors or those matters over which council will ensure are replicated there so that they can also be had regard to at D, in my submission, would be useful at D to ensure that when consent applications are before a council officer, they have something to guide their assessment of efficiency of water use, bearing in mind that what our case to you today is, is that viticulture has good grounds to be able to make a consenting argument under 104 around those sorts of things. Uh, and it would help give, it would help council officers and also viticulture have an understanding of what efficiency is. Mr. Sinclair might wish to expand oh, on so, that. But sorry, and I'd, and in the, because 47 is only about when you're considering a consent application, not when you're actually um, looking at um, how um, the. It, um, for instance, in policy 46, which is just above that, will ensure efficient management and allocation by, and it's the actual, um, it's ones to do with resource consents, ones looking about how you actually manage the allocation. So you need, you, yep, and the one 46 and 47 are about surface water, 37 is about um, what is it, groundwater in terms of the aquifer. So it's just consistency across all of those policies and how it would apply. That's noted. Thank, Thank you. you. So the key point is they should be totally, well, nearly totally aligned with one another. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners. Our next uh, submission from Delegate Limited, and um, Ms. Bloomfield, welcome again. And we, do we? Now I'm, I'm going to say this slowly. Do we have Dr. Bengasami Balasubram Maniam? Um, he goes. He calls himself Bala, so should we just use that for um, simplicity? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, he had suffered a health event over oh. Queen's birthday weekend and he's presently in hospital um, and very distressed that he can't be here today. But in the time since I became aware of that, 
I've not been able to organise to have somebody else from delegate the tender has stead. So I'm afraid it's just me. Um, and again, I'm asking for the panel's indulgence. Um, if there are questions that require answers from a representative of delegate, if I might be permitted to take a note of those questions and provide answers in writing. You seem to be having a tough effect on your expert I, 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 I feel like, yes, that's right. I'm getting a reputation. Well, in the first instance, we're very sorry to hear the doctor is, is unable to attend uh, due to being um, unwell. And certainly, um, if we have questions, we can put those in writing. Thank and you. Put those through to you. Um, so we've just got the statement of evidence and your legal submission. So um, certainly for myself, I, I didn't get the opportunity to have a read through your legal submissions uh, last night. Um, so I was happy for you to take us through those pertinent parts that you'd like to focus on. Thank you. So I start by saying that um, these submissions are supported by the statement of evidence that's been provided by Bala. He is the Grower Business uh, Development Manager for Delegate. Just some background, which you may have read when you read through Delegate's original submission, but in Hawke's Bay they have over a thousand hectares of planned vineyard plantings in the Crownthorpe and Gimlet gravel areas of the Naruroro catchment. So of that, um, there are 677 hectares of planted and productive vineyard currently established, and there's also a substantial winery development located on Evenden Road. And there is, um, just for your reference, attached um, as document A to Bala's evidence, an aerial map showing the location of those vineyards and of the winery development as well if that helps. Thank you. So the current value of those resources is significant, as I've said at paragraph four, over $230 million. The company employs a number of permanent staff, 30 of them, and then between 100 and 300 contractors on a seasonal basis. I've said at paragraph six that the winery development on Evenden Road has been future-proofed, so um, consents were granted basically um, for the ultimate um, processing of up to 20,000 tonnes of grapes per annum um, sourced from the winery site, Delegate's other vineyards in Hawke's Bay, as well as the 400 or so hectares of land that Delegate intends to plant over the next 10 year time frame. It holds a number of consents and those are set out at paragraph seven of my submissions. At paragraph eight, I've just set out the primary concern that delegates have about, delegate has about this plan change, and that is as the plan change, its effect on the company's ability to renew consents for planned future development which have not been fully implemented at the time the existing consent expires. So that, that issue is, is similar to the concern that uh, TNG had um, and that I addressed you on yesterday. Um, I've set out at paragraph nine the provisions that were supported by delegate in its submission on the plan change. I don't intend to go through that long list. But at paragraph 10 on page three, I simply record that um, delegate is comfortable with the officer's recommendations that have been made in respect of those provisions, even where there has been some amendment recommended. So there's nothing more that I need to say about those submissions. Uh, at paragraph 11, I've simply listed for completeness the uh, provisions of the proposed plan change that Delegate opposed in its um, initial submission. And it had sought some amended uh, wording. But it, having read again the officer's report, it supports officer's recommendations in respect of the list of provisions that I've set out at paragraph 11. At paragraph 12, I just address this remaining concern that Delegate has about the proposed plan change. And that relates to um, the policies 36F 
and the definition of actual and reasonable. And the concern is that those provisions potentially preclude the use of a consented but unused allocation of water related to future planned primary production or primary, primary production development. So to give an illustration of where this issue might arise, let us say that a winery holds consent to abstract water required to process the crop um, from planned future vineyard expansions. As Bala explains, because of the time um, and the money and the effort that it takes to plan and implement the development of new wineries and vineyards, it is possible that not all of the vineyard intended to be redeveloped and irrigated at the time the original consent was granted have in fact been planted. Um, and if they haven't been planted, then they won't have been irrigated. And that might be the position at the time the existing resource consent expires. Or a different scenario where this might arise is where an existing vineyard is being redeveloped, but the replanting vineyard, according to Bala's e replanted vineyard, according to Bala's evidence, will have below average water use during the first three years of replanting. If at consent renewal time water use is capped at the maximum water use prior to full development of the vineyard, my reading of the definition of actual and reasonable uh, says that the remaining area may not be able to be developed. If the time frame of record used to determine actual and reasonable use includes the first three years after replanting, then the application of the maximum annual take may not be enough to irrigate the vineyard when those vines are older and require more water. And that is why Delegate has sought amendments to policy 36F and also G to address that concern. And I have set out the suggested, um, sorry, that is why Delegate had sought amendments. But in response to this, council officers had actually recommended some changes be made to rule tank nine, and that that rule be amended to refer to replacement consents. Now that change is thought to be a helpful one by delegate, but they have sought some consequential amendments to condition B of tank rule nine in the way that I have set out in paragraph 18. And so the proposed new wording is in brackets there and underlined as you can see. And so it talks about, uh, an application is either for the continuation of a water taken use previously authorised in a permit issued before 2 May 2020, including the irrigation for previous planned but not yet, but as yet unimplemented primary production development and associated processing. Now, if I haven't persuaded the hearing panel to make that amendment, um, then Bala has suggested an alternative in paragraph 31 of his evidence, and that is a change to policy 36F. So similar wording it is proposed will be introduced into that policy. Now, um, Mr Chairman, yesterday one of the questions that you asked of me when I raised this issue or a very similar one for T&G was um, whether, whether this was a bit of a Trojan horse argument, I think was the phrase that you used. And, and I don't know whether that is, um, whether my answer, the, the answer that I gave yesterday was satisfactory. I mean, I have gone through and carefully analysed the definition of actual and reasonable um, this morning in order to work out whether this argument actually has legs or whether I'm seeing things that aren't there. So if it would be helpful for me to go through that definition and explain how I've got to the position that I've gotten to, I can do that. But only if you think that would be helpful. Yes, please. Okay. So if we turn to the definition of actual and reasonable. So let's say we're at, we're at renewal time for um, a development that had a water take and use consent but hasn't been fully implemented. So the development is partially underway. Mm -hmm. So the consent is, is held for a particular property and the details of that property will presumably be accurately recorded in the existing uh, resource consent to take and use water. But when you come to the definition of actual and reasonable, you're required to work through the three clauses A, B and C to work out whether or not uh, the use qualifies. So if you look at clause A, in this scenario that I'm talking about, 
the applicant would be applying for the same amount of water in this scenario, because they already had a resource consent for the full extent of the planned development. So there's no issue there. When you look at clause B, the applicant, in order to qualify as having actual and reasonable use, is effectively capped at the maximum amount of water used in the 10-year period prior to 2 May 2020. Okay, we understand that. But in this case, we've got a consent applicant who hasn't used all of the water required for the development because the development hasn't been completed yet. So that means that the maximum water use over that 10-year period is going to fall short of what is required for the planned development once it's fully implemented and complete. And then because Clause A requires you to adopt the lesser of B or C, you have to go then to Clause C. And that requires the application of Irocalc, but we also need to read the clause in its entirety, which takes us to subclauses 1 and 2 of Clause C. So as I read those clauses, the first question under 1 is, is the irrigated area more than the permit due for renewal? Well, the answer to that is perhaps it depends. Um, I'm assuming here that in this case the property is exactly the same property, so, so no expansion beyond the boundary of the existing permit. But then you also have to ask yourself, is the irrigated area more than the amount irrigated in the 10 years preceding the 2nd of May? So that's the second part of Roman numeral one. And the answer in this case is, well, actually it might be. And then there's also subclause two, uh, which needs to be met as well by an applicant in order to qualify as having actual and reasonable use. And that requires them to supply evidence to demonstrate um, that the area has been irrigated. Now, depending on the nature of the development, um, not all of the area for which consent is now being sought might have been irrigated prior to consent renewal. So, on my read of this definition, there is a real issue here um, for applicants who future-proof their initial resource consent for water take and use haven't quite gotten all the way in terms of implementing that consent and want to come back again at renewal time and ask for the same amount of water, even though they haven't used all of their existing allocation prior to renewal. Thank you. So, I'm now back at paragraph 20 of my uh, submissions. And I simply note that um, in its submission, Delegate had sought an amendment to policy 36G. Um, that's not been made in the hearing report or the addendum report. But reporting officers recommended changes to condition E of, sorry, yes, changes to condition E of Rule Tank 9 uh, through its deletion and also amendment to Condition C of that rule and also a change to the definition of an actual and reasonable so that it refers to maximum rather than the average. Um, delegate supports those changes for the reasons that I have set out at paragraph 22 and I know that um, you will have heard plenty of evidence this morning from wine growers um, about how the average water use um, is simply not going to cut it. So I'm happy to take that paragraph as read, but it obviously it just draws on Bala's evidence on that point. So he has also suggested some further amendments to the definition of actual and reasonable, and this is to address the concern about Planned, a future planned primary production development and the ability to renew consents for development of that type. Now, I don't intend to read that out, but it does draw on, it's, it's very similar wording that has been suggested elsewhere in these legal submissions and in Bala's evidence. Um, probably the main addition, um, to make it absolutely clear, is under the second bullet point that I've proposed be added, 
to uh, subclause Roman numerals 1 of C. So that's to cover a situation for where there's a replacement consent um, to allow any allocation previously held effectively to be considered within the definition of actual and reasonable. And sorry, while I'm, I should read this more carefully. Um, the second point is also the requirement in subclause two. Some particular wordings being proposed to address the situation where you've got a replacement consent. It's going to be difficult for a, um, a, con a consent holder who hasn't fully utilised their consent to provide evidence to demonstrate that the, the area has been irrigated when perhaps part of it hasn't. So some, an extra sentence has been proposed to address that issue, where evidence must be supplied instead by the applicant to demonstrate that the area will be irrigated and that the permit will substantially be given effect to. I don't propose to add to what I've said about policy 37E at paragraph 25. I'll leave you to read that um, for yourselves. Submissions were also made by delegate on uh, Rule Tank 5, 6 and Schedule 29. Schedule 29 has been substantially rewritten, as I know the hearing panel is aware. Um, that's an improvement um, and they're supported. Those proposed changes suggested by the reporting officers are supported by delegate. Thank you. We'll see if we've got any questions. Can I just clarify? It's the it's the um, if we go to your expert witnesses um, statement, the storage is for the first of those consents listed in his paragraph 17, 143 T, and he explains that over the page. So that's to provide for taking of it in storage for two reservoirs since constructed. So that's now operational, as I would that's, understand it. That's correct, yes. And can I just go to your wording, um, potential wording, so if we look at your paragraph 24, for instance, and your B there, my difficulty with those words, and this is only a first reaction, is it's very open-ended, um, and any replacement consents, plus for replacement consents, presumably for any allocation previously held for planned but as yet unimplemented primary production, development and associated processing. Words like that, I think, uh, there's no time frame ceiling on it, there's no test of what is plans but as yet unimplemented. Um, my, my difficulty would be with those, the very open-ended nature of that. Do you have any suggestions that could make that more tight? for any allocation previously held for um, for planned and you know, but as yet unimplemented that could be 10 years out in the next two years in the next as I did wonder about yes as you asked me the question um, and as you heard my long pause by way of answer I did wonder about um, whether having some kind of time, time bound requirement might assist. And although that might 
adding those words might give some certainty. I, I was pausing to think about how council officers processing a resource consent application would be able to be satisfied by an applicant that in fact, you know, within two years, five years, ten years, whatever the time frame is, that this development would in fact be implemented. But I can see that having a time frame in it would give more certainty than is presently there. And I suppose that just then becomes an implementation and interpretation issue and a matter of proof for the applicant at the time that whatever the time frame <coughs> is, they can intend to propose to meet it. You're, you're either time bound or some sort of evidence towards progress. Yes, and I think evidence towards progress is something that um, is more easily satisfied in the same way as um, the, the Act allows for um, progress of consents that haven't been fully implemented prior to their expiry, substantial progress perhaps. And of course that doesn't necessarily mean even getting to the point of uh, planting the vines in the case of a vineyard, if the applicant can show that they've gone, you know, their financial planning processes un <coughs> are underway and the preparatory steps have been taken, that might satisfy council officers that this, this development is actually going to happen. And I'm pretty sure, um, in his evidence, Bala gives some examples of the types of things that might happen before the on-the-ground um, planned production development is actually planted and running. And I'm just going to try and find that. Yes, we do, in your two, um, I'm not sure of the reason why, demonstrate the area will be irrigated and the permit substantially given effect to. Um, I'm not sure why that's different in the earlier ones, but I'm sure there's a reason. That, um, so it goes B or C. Yes. One, two, then there's an and, and two is a conjunctive of C, isn't it? But it's the same thing's not in B the alternative clause, if you see what I mean? I think I do see what you mean. Mm, I think, the, the, yes, the wording there is different and it, mm. perhaps it doesn't need to be. I mean, the intention there was to capture the, the the fact that part of a property may not yet have been irrigated, and the first part of C requires proof that an area has been irrigated. Um, but in the scenario that we're talking about, an applicant won't be able to meet that threshold because it hasn't been, or at least some part of it hasn't been. But perhaps the wording there isn't as elegant as it might be, and it would be, could be, uh, could reflect more closely the wording elsewhere in the, in the provision. Yes, it's perhaps a different way of saying the same thing. That's what it's intended to be, I think. My If this referred to specifically to storage, I probably wouldn't have a much of an issue with it. Um, my problem remains just that it's very open-ended. Um, plus any allocation for water storage, um, I, be, I don't see so much of an issue for that with that, but maybe more widely. I'm thinking aloud. I understood. I'm answering <laughs> you, asking you a question. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. We didn't have any. We didn't have any further questions. Thank you. 
Thank you for coming and presenting again. Um, are we looking forward to seeing you again in the <laughs> next yeah, week? Well? I am going to be back this afternoon, and I think I'll actually have a client with me this time, so I won't have had any kind of dire health effects on this one. You'd be best to wrap them in cotton wool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr John Palmer. Welcome to the hearing. Thank you for waiting patiently. We're just going to bring up your. Yeah, I noticed the ones before. Okay, just to... okay. I'm waiting for you. Are you ready? We're um we're all electronic, so we just yeah, um, I yeah, I'm just <laughs> not sure. Hoping my finger will be as fast as um, <laughs> we'd like it to be. There it is. Excellent. Yes, we're ready. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to be fairly quick and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about clauses and stuff. Um, I'm looking at this from 30,000 feet rather than looking down in the twigs. And my contention is that the uh, mechanism for reducing the allocations in the Nararora catchment is, has the effect of locking in existing crop use, etc., and prevents any um, ability for people to change crop use and react to consumer demand. We are growing what we're growing because people want to buy what we're growing, and by doing this and just pulling it back to what happened in the last, at the moment, 10 years, and now apparently a maximum, not an average, st still prevents people from changing use. As you will know, um, grapes have, in the last few years, had some difficulty in selling, but apples, 15 years ago, you couldn't sell an apple to save your life, and now everybody wants to grow apples. What, by doing this, you would prevent people from switching out of grapes into apples if you are in marginal grape growing land where you struggle to perhaps ripen the grape varieties that you have and you now want to move to something which consumers want rather than something that they don't want. What it also does is it affects the value of people's land and I've given you my little story of my <coughs> own situation, which I'm not going to read out. You've read that, I hope. Mm. The point is that if you cut everybody's, or not everybody's, but some people's allocation, allocation which has not yet been used, and if you read my story, you'll understand that it was used, but it wasn't used in the last 10 years, then what you do is you reduce the value of that land. And I'm not sure that the regional council's role should be to reduce the value of people's lands arbitrarily and by contrast, possibly increase the value of other people's lands, simply by taking away the key commodity of water. And finally, um, if we have to drop the um, the, the take levels in the river, what is stated is this is about an 18% drop. So why not, it's much simpler than all this stuff, just knock everybody back by 18%. It's easy, it's kind of fair. Not even sure that actually it's necessary because unless we get close to low flow levels, then arguably there's plenty of water for everybody. When we're at low flow, of course it's different. That's all I need to say. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. We'll see if we've got any questions. So you've currently got consents for your property? Yeah. Do, do you know 
what the consent involves in terms of your, the limits? Uh, not offhand, but it's 33 metres a second, and I use about 10 or 12. That's the capacity of my pump. Uh, you're on, the you're point is, we used to, not me, but my the previous owner used to uh, have grow apples, 10 hectares of apples, and yes. irrigated those and used a lot more. Um, and those apples were deemed not very economically sensible. This is 15 years ago, and he, uh, they took them out. Well, I took them out, but anyway, he stopped growing the apples. But okay. now, of course, I'm sure people would love to grow apples there. Certainly people would like to grow grapes there, and if we operate according to the regional council's rules, I wouldn't even be allowed to grow any grapes down there, 10 hectares of grapes. There are plenty of people knocking on my door asking me to plant. And grapes are seem extremely efficient users of water, mm. as you know. So that's my issue. Mm. But I'm concerned about the thing from a regional point of view. Mm. You look at the situation up at delegates we've just had, they've just bought, what was a dairy farm, she used to chuck water on with big um, irrigators, just irrigating grass, they're now going to irrigate very efficiently for grapes in the same sort of area of land, and somehow seem to be struggling possibly to get water for that, which is bizarre. Well, thank you, Mr. Palmer. We didn't have any further questions. Thanks for okay. your submission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aotearoa New Zealand Fine Wines, Mr. Smith. Yes. Thank you. We had last submission before lunch. Mm. Kia ora katoa. My name is uh, Stephen Smith. I am Managing Director of Aotearoa New Zealand Fine Wine Estates. Um, this addendum is to the, the submissions that we've already made, um, and uh, in my uh, paper I've given, given my, my, the detail of my background and my experience in this. I've spent my entire life since leaving high school in the New Zealand wine industry, um, firstly as an academic, then in business with Villa Maria, followed by being co-founder and for 16 years CEO of Craggy Range. I've lived here for 30 years and I've spent a considerable amount of my non-wine time in areas outside um, outside wine, by being Chancellor of Lincoln University, I sit on the New Zealand Story Board and the Primary Sector Council and chair the independent panel for the Sustainable Food and Fibres Fund on behalf of the Ministry of Primary Industries. My submissions here are basically on two um, areas, um, to respond to updates in the current recommendations of PPC9 and to provide more depth to, to specific issues in the Gimlet Gravels wine growing district and with our own property located in the Gimlet Gravels. Firstly, with the Gimlet Gravels. The Gimlet Gravels wine growing district is a circa 800 hectare parcel of land located between Roy's Hill, Fern Hill, and Flaxmere on the Heratonga Plains. It is the only appellation in the world defined absolutely by location and soil type. I led the creation of the Gimlet Gravels Wine Growers Association in 2001, which defined the appellation using international trademark law. The district has one of the most remarkable stories of any agricultural land in New Zealand, and indeed of any in the world. It has come from being an embarrassment for the region, a land of drag strips, rubbish tips, rabbit infestation, abandonment, feedlots, and negative economic and social impact, to becoming one of the most famous wine growing districts in the world in under 30 years. Remarkably, this happened initially because of the entrepreneurial spirit of the likes of Chris Pask and Alan Limmer, but by far the most impactful move came from this institution in a previous guise as the Hastings District Council, uh, sorry, as the Hastings City Council. In 1988, the Hastings City Council declined a mining application by Fraser Shingle to mine gravel of 150 hectares of land in the district that is now the home to the vineyards of Craggy Range, Terra Vitae, and Villa Maria. They did so, did so when in fact their statutes allowed them to do this without much consultation. However, to their great credit, they took their case to a hearing so that the community could have its say. 
I was alongside Alan Limmer, John Buck and Jim Hamilton who led the submissions on behalf of the wine industry. Our evidence was based on the premise but that by allowing mining you destroyed one of the most valuable pieces of wine growing land in the region and removed the significant positive impact this has on reputation, economic, environmental and social outcomes for the region. The Hastings City Council did not grant Fraser Shingle a mining licence and the application then went to the planning tribunal. They too supported the Hastings City Council decision and in doing so set a valuable precedent for the protection of these special lands. This whole series of events would simply not have occurred and no vine would be growing in these lands without two valuable resources from nature. These gravelly soils that create warm, low vigour growing conditions for high quality red wine and the underground water resource required to keep these vines alive and productive. The situation in the Gimlet gravels is unique. A soil with low productivity, fertility and water holding capacity mean that almost no other horticultural or agricultural crop could survive on it, in it, without excessive application of water and nutrients and the negative environment, in, environmental impacts that brings. B, a plant, the grapevine, that produces its greatest wine when it is struggling a little for nutrients and water, so naturally adapted for wine growing in these warm, low vigour soils. However, these soils don't have enough water in them naturally for even a vine to survive, let alone produce a high quality economic crop. And while these soils are low in nutrients, little fertiliser is required by a grapevine simply because these vines and the winemaking model do not require it. Without a reliable high quality source of water, there will be no Gimlet Gravels wine growing districts as the vines will die. That is why the Gimlet Gravels Wine Growing District is unique in its water use requirements when compared to other soils and land use of the Heratonga Plains. It is a do or die scenario. The district's long term proper, oh, sorry just a minute. Um, alongside Marlborough and Central Otago, the Gimlet Gravels is the most widely recognised appellation in New Zealand in world markets, more so even than Hawke's Bay. A collection of New Zealand's most desirable and expensive wines are produced here and some of our most iconic wineries, Craggy Range, Trinity Hill, Temata, McDonald Winery, Elephant Hill, Smith and & Sheath and Stonecroft source grapes from the region. The Hastings District Council recognised the region by creating the Roy's Hill overlay within its district plan to recognise the special characteristics of the district. The district's long-term proposition and potential impact on the prosperity of this region are being put at risk by PPC9 in its current form. As I've said, it is a do or die scenario. What am I asking for here? I'm asking that the tank process and the Hawke's Bay Regional Council respect the unique properties of the Gimlet Gravels Wine Growing District and the Roy's Hill overlay in the Hastings District Plan and set policy that reflects it. If that means a more nuanced and intellectual means of allocating water than the current blunt instrument approached, then so be it. That is your responsibility to our society and it is important. What do I mean by nuanced? Water rights that reflect vine water use in the district and encourage and enable storage use in the spring, uh, storage when water use in the, is less in the spring and autumn if producers to wish to mitigate risk. Ensuring vineyards in the district have water for the vines to survive and maximize quality potential in warm, dry vintages. Recognizing that even at this level, their water use and nutrient leaching is significantly less than many other forms of horticulture. Also work with the wineries of the district to maximise the efficiency of water use at an agronomic and economic level. I'd like to say in support of my other um, uh, wine industry colleagues that there are other parts of Hawke's Bay that also share some of the similar issues of the Gimlet Gravels, where they have excessively stony soils. The Gimlet Gravels is easy to talk about because it's a delineated area, um, whereas these other of others often are small parcels of parts of other pieces of land but there are other parts of the district that, that would require a similar approach. I'd now like to talk about the specific situation of our property at 2264 State Highway 50, and in this I'm dealing with similar issues that have just been raised by delegates. Our property lies in the heart of the Gimlet Gravels wine growing district. PPC9 in its current form will realistically mean our property is unable to be used for ultra premium wine production, and the vines and, vi and vineyards will either die or need to be removed. I will explain why as we go on, but first some background to set the scene. 
We, over, we have invested over a million dollars on this property as part of a $50 million investment in the New Zealand ultra premium wine industry. It is yet to produce a full crop because the vines are young. It is a fundamental pillar to our ultra premium business strategy. It is a small four hectare lot with 3.3 hectares of vineyard planted between 2000, excuse me, 2017 and 2020. The vineyard is targeted to produce ultra premium wine selling for between $40 and $150 per bottle. Ours is a unique model that requires absolute perfection of great quality and vineyard location. Our long-term business plan shows this vineyard producing up to $2.5 million of revenue or three quarters of a million dollars per productive hectare, making this some of the highest revenue generation of any horticultural crops with one of the lowest impacts on water resource and environmental income, our outcomes. Our modelling shows that in the highest quality vintages that will secure these sorts of revenues, we will require up to 16,500 cubic metres of water over the entire season, or 5,000 cubic metres per hectare per season. Our consent allows for this level of water use. This is significantly less than other forms of intensive agriculture and horticulture, for example, kiwi, kiwi fruit sitting at circa 10,000 cubic metres per hectare per annum. In terms of economic efficiency of our water use, by that I mean dollars returned per litre of water, our vineyard would sit amongst the most efficient of any water users in this country. This occurs alongside specific low environmental impact that these vineyards have when compared to other forms of agriculture and horticulture, as outlined in Emma Taylor's evidence for Hawke's Bay wine growers. Vineyards like ours simply represent true sustainability operating at its highest level and should be encouraged by appropriate policy around resource use rather than be placed on the edge of a precipice. The point here is without the water availability in the very best vintages, which happen to be the driest and warmest, requiring the application rates outlined above, these returns would not be achieved. This property was purchased by us in 2016 as bare land. It is important to note, however, that the property had previously been planted in two cycles of horticulture, apricots and persimmons, and therefore had a water right supplying 713 cubic metres of water per seven days at a take of 6.3 litres per second to support that activity. However, the then owners had been undertaking no horticultural activity, I believe, since the mid-2000s, and certainly none since 2007. The property was bare land when we purchased it. Therefore, water use during that period was almost nil, apart from domestic and stock use. There was no water meter in place and no water use records available from the previous, previous owners or on record by the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. The water rights were purchased with the property in 2016 and renewed in 2017 by the Hawke's Bay Regional Council in their existing form. They are sufficient for our intensive, high quality, low environmental impact model. The purchase of these water rights was a condition of purchase would not, which would not have occurred if we had not been able to access appropriate amounts of water. Not because the vines would have had low productivity, they would have had no productivity because they would have died. PPC 9 proposes under policy 37D2, actual and reasonable water use that reflects land use and water use authorised in the 10 years up to 2017. I recognise that this date has now been extended out for the 10 years up to 2020 and suggests averaging water use over those 10 years. Averaging will be spectacularly prejudicial in our situation. The proposed policy fails the rational thinking test because it inappropriately su suggests that all the land associated with a water right is opera operating under the full productive potential of that land during the 10 year period previously. Our vineyard is an extreme example of the impact of this proposed policy. We did not start irrigating until the spring of 2017 when 27% of our vineyard was planted. The vineyard was fully planted by spring 2020 but will not be in full production until April 2023. I predict maximum water use will be between 2021 and 2027, after which the mature vines will need less water during the entire growing season but likely require the maximum weekly takes during the height of a hot dry summer. Under this proposed policy, we will have no records of our vineyard being in full production to assess actual and reasonable water use of a productive vineyard. During the 10 year period prior to August 2020, we have had seven years of zero irrigation because the land was bare, 
one year of 20% of consent because we only had a small amount of planted area, one year of 60% of consent, and one year of 80% of consent. These figures are not absolute, but, abs but illustrate the issue. Under the current policy setting, we may be in a situation when, when renewing a consent that the council looks at these records and will only renew the consent on a tiny percentage of, of our actual water requirements. This is simply a ludicrous situation that puts at severe risk our entire investment in the property simply because of inappropriate policy settings. Remember, this investment was made with the knowledge that we had been granted a water consent entirely appropriate and critical to our investment decision. Remember also that vines can die in this area without appropriate water. As responsible landowners, we have applied for water consents to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. They have been granted and we have operated within them. It is not our fault that the Hawke's Bay Regional Council had granted these consents and potentially over allocated a resource, and we sh therefore should not bear the brunt of we should not bear the brunt of that through an ill-conceived policy setting. What am I asking for? I support entirely the philosophy that we are simply caretakers of this land and that we have a strained resource and we all need to work together to come up with a solution. I also understand the motivation behind this policy being the fact that people hold a bunch of underused or of inefficiently used water rights that contribute to either poor environmental outcomes or unrealised economic potential. I also understand that not renewing any water rights that are not being used or used inefficiently will help reduce stress on the resource and its allocation. I request policy settings settings, I request policy settings that the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, that lead the Hawke's Bay Regional Council to recognise that there will be individual circumstances where the actual and reasonable over 10 years test does not provide a proper assessment of proper responsible water use on any given piece of land. Specifically where individuals have made an investment decision based on having an operational water right during this 10 year period prior to August 2020 and they can show that their proposed use of water when under full integration irrigation is, efficiently, is efficient economically and environmentally. That right should be allowed to continue its, in its current form as if the land use was fully productive. These decisions are easier when the volume of take is very small and the policy should reflect that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We'll see if we've got any questions. Yes, Mr. Smith, there are alternative ways of calculating your water use. Have you had a look, hard look at that definition of actual and reasonable? Because it does allow for two alternative pathways. Uh, one is using Irical. One is. It's the uh, lesser of, though, isn't it? Pardon? As I understand it, the, the decision is made, you use the lesser of one of three scenarios. No, it says no more than the quantity specified on the permit due for renewal or any lesser amount applied for and the least of either. So I think that says B is the one that you've cited. And then it says if insufficient is or no accurate data is available, either clause A on unsure about the circular reference there, or C will be applied. So that would lead you into the error calculation pathway, provided you have insufficient or no accurate data. Which I and do. Yeah. I, I think somebody, well, somebody said this morning it's unclear what those words mean, yeah. um, because they're not defined. And the question is, in my mind, you would fall into that category, into the error default. I, I would have no problem if the policy setting was a consent that was based on Ericel um, or, or some other acceptable model that shows reasonable water use. But the way that the clause is written at the moment leads us to believe that we could be exposed to the, the lesser of. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. the thing that concerns us. Okay. And the threshold of what's insufficient or no accurate data is um, very unspecific, isn't it? It's sort of quite easy in our situation because we have seven years of zero data. Yes. <laughs> so um, that's yeah. relatively yes. easy to... But there might with. be people in much more ambiguous yeah. situations than you. Yeah, no, I agree totally, yeah. Thank you. Dr Ryder, did you have any questions? No questions. We didn't have any further questions, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. We're going to pause for lunch and we're going to come back at
Yeah, we're going to come back at 10 minutes past two. Um, we'll have limestone properties, Gavin Yort, two terraces, vineyard, and Ngaru Roro Irrigation Society, and that will complete our day. Thank you very much, everyone.